Today, I'm glad to introduce you our speaker, Andre uh, Saragodos-Pev. Probably I made a couple of mistakes in pronouncing his name. He does tell you the correct pronunciation. Uh, Andre works currently in France for the Marseille Center of Physics, but he has a background in nuclear physics. He is from uh, he was graduated as a nuclear physics engineer in Leningrad Polytechnic Institute and then obtained a PhD in nuclear physics from, from the St. Petersburg uh, Nuclear Physics Institute. Between 1991 and 1999, he worked at CERN and was involved in the S3, then in the LHCB experiments. And then in 1999, he moved to France where he works at the moment as a senior research engineer. Today, Andre will talk about the Dirac distributed computing services and the different offerings and configuration options and services that the Dirac collaboration offers for uh, EGI user communities. Uh, thank you, Gergely, uh, for uh, this introduction. Uh, today, uh, I will present you the Direct project, uh, the software that it is developing, the services uh, that it is uh, uh, providing to its users. And uh, uh, on slide number two, uh, the outline uh, of the presentation is that uh, I will start with a brief uh, introduction, uh, motivation for the project, and a bit of a history. Uh, the software that we are speaking about, uh, what are the computing resources? available for the users of the Dirac system, uh, who are already the users uh, of uh, Dirac, uh, what, what communities, and uh, uh, how uh, Dirac software now is uh, offered uh, to the users as a ready-to-use uh, service. And I finish uh, with my conclusions. So slide number three. Um, so uh, when speaking about Dirac, we are speaking about uh, uh, grid computing about massive computations uh, which are nowadays are usually associated uh, with the computational grids and uh, uh, these were the high energy physics experiments which uh, pioneered uh, the massive use uh, of the computational grids yeah for the good reasons because they are collecting uh, a lot of petabytes of data uh, using uh, hundreds of thousands of CPUs in many centers uh, and uh, the high energy physics collaborations uh, have many hundreds of users uh, from hundreds of institutions. And uh, uh, the whole high energy physics uh, community was delighted uh, uh, on the occasion of the Higgs discovery to uh, hear from the Director General uh, of CERN uh, 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 that uh, the grid computing was one of the major contributors uh, to the success of this event, of the discovery of the Higgs boson. Uh, but uh, what is amazing also is that other domains are catching up very quickly with the high energy physics experiment uh, and the domains like life sciences, earth observation sciences, astrophysics, social sciences, and many others are uh, getting uh, uh, um, my more uh, needs in the computational power for their everyday work. And then uh, uh, this is all good, uh, but uh, massive computations are not uh, very easy. So there are problems. And uh, uh, in the large high energy physics experiment, uh, uh, usually there are dedicated teams of experts uh, to build uh, their computing systems and uh, they are relying on dedicated grid resources. So in this sense, uh, uh, they have uh, good advantages uh, um, in uh, building such systems. Um, but in the other scientific domains, uh, the computing expertise level is uh, uh, relatively low. And uh, usually the users are grouped uh, around uh, well-known applications uh, or dedicated systems for the computations. And uh, uh, introducing new applications uh, to uh, use uh, on the grid environment in the grid environment is not that easy. So uh, usually those research groups are not uh, very uh, large, and uh, uh, there is a clear need uh, for easy to use tools uh, for small research groups uh, 
uh, which don't have uh, expertise uh, in the grid computing. And uh, in this sense, uh, the experience that we have acquired in the high energy physics domain can be very useful for the non-high energy physics users. Slide number five. <clears throat> so those users uh, of small user communities, uh, uh, they are uh, experiencing uh, quite a number of problems when uh, entering into the grid environment. So first of all, the interfaces uh, are not, uh, if not even complicated, they are not uh, familiar to the non-computing experts. Uh, there is of, uh, often a, a kind of frustration uh, with uh, failing uh, resources or services or middleware and uh, uh, very often that uh, something that worked yesterday is not working today because something has changed uh, uh, on the grid. Uh, for <clears throat> uh, small uh, communities, uh, it is a bit difficult to organize uh, a collective work uh, of users. So, so every, every user is uh, on a his own. So there is a lack, certainly lack of expertise uh, of uh, high level computing tasks, how to uh, massively submit jobs, how to uh, make massive uh, data movement operations uh, and things like that. Uh, and uh, very often uh, the uh, applications need uh, rather complicated workflows uh, and uh, in order to uh, control, to manage these uh, workflows, we need to custom, custom services, and uh, so those custom services uh, are not evident how to go in the grid environment. And uh, in the end, uh, the smaller user communities tend to become larger with time. Um, and then uh, for the large user communities, uh, there are specific uh, problems. Uh, so uh, larger user communities have access uh, to more computing resources, which are starting to be heterogeneous because uh, these are different uh, grids or different computing clusters with different technologies of access and so on. Uh, there should be in the large communities, especially uh, uh, management of the workload uh, within the community itself. Uh, so it will have uh, internal structure with user groups and uh, activities that should have uh, quotas priorities and all these should be managed uh, uh, within uh, this large community. And uh, of course, uh, the applications uh, become uh, uh, varied and numerous, uh, and uh, um, these need uh, special attention. And uh, high energy physics experiments are typical examples of those uh, large uh, communities. So, in order to cope uh, with these and other problems uh, in the uh, high energy physics domain, all the LHC experiments have developed uh, their own middleware stack uh, to address uh, the problem that I have just mentioned. Just uh, to mention a few, uh, Panda system of Atlas experiment, Alien system of uh, Alice experiment, uh, gliding WMS, FedEx of uh, CMS. So the Direct project uh, was uh, originally developed uh, for the uh, one of the LEC experiments, which is uh, LECB. And uh, uh, the stated goals at the beginning were that uh, we should be able to easily integrate uh, all the heterogeneous uh, resources which are available uh, for, which were available for LHCB, provide solution for all the LHCB tasks, including workload management and data management tasks. And uh, LHCB is a relatively small collaboration, so we wanted to minimize the human intervention uh, and. Uh, um, uh, to control the system, uh, especially, and uh, also to demand uh, as less as possible support uh, from the resources providers and the site managers. And in the end, uh, yes, we wanted to make a uh, great uh, convenience for the LCD users with so the simple intuitive interfaces. Uh, a lot of attention was uh, paid uh, to the uh, fault tolerance uh, and uh, uh, increasing the turnaround of the user jobs and uh, enabling uh, the policies of the LECB policies uh, among the LECB groups uh, and users. And uh, uh, so this was uh, the beginning uh, and uh, uh, the project started at about 2002 and uh, the experience that we have collected uh, since then uh, with the production system of the LECB experiment, which is a large half experiment, uh, we think uh, is uh, very valuable. And uh, since then, uh, several other experiments expressed interest in using this uh, software, 
uh, relying on the experience and the proven uh, utility of this project. So in, in about 1909, uh, uh, the co-development uh, team of the Dirac project decided to generalize uh, the software to make it suitable for any user community. So this was a, a very uh, complicated exercise uh, in rearrangement of the software, which probably deserves a, a separate seminar because it was a quite a interesting and useful exercise. So, <clears throat> so uh, we have separated all the LCB specific functionality into a set of extensions uh, and the plugins uh, uh, to the generic uh, core libraries. Uh, uh, we have um, introduced uh, new services uh, to make uh, this uh, middleware stack a complete uh, solution uh, so that uh, users using that uh, can uh, within the same environment can uh, uh, solve all their uh, problems. Uh, we have introduced uh, a support uh, of multiple small groups uh, by a single direct installation unlike uh, just uh, one large group LHCB for a single installation and uh, we have uh, made a lot of general refurbishing of the code, code management, uh, deployment procedures, uh, documentation and so on. And uh, so the results of this work are presenting, uh, presented uh, today in the, in the following. So uh, what uh, uh, Dirk is offering as uh, uh, soft, which software component is offering and uh, uh, which uh, services uh, uh, the users of Dirk uh, can count on. I start uh, first uh, with the uh, core uh, system of Dirk, which is a workload management. And the uh, workload management of Dirk is uh, uh, based on the paradigm of the pilot jobs. So uh, this paradigm is uh, adopted by all the four LET experiments, but uh, maybe it is not that well known uh, outside the high energy physics uh, community. So I will spend a couple of slides uh, explaining uh, what it is all about. So we are moving to slide number 10. <clears throat> so uh, what uh, probably we have in hand, at hand uh, here. So we have uh, a user which uh, has to do some uh, computational work uh, in the grid environment. And uh, we have uh, various uh, uh, grid uh, or some other uh, resources uh, that the user in principle can access. So now we have to build a link uh, in between uh, the user tasks and uh, the resources where they can grab. And this is done uh, by means of the direct uh, workload management system. Uh, uh, with the central task queue as a central piece uh, of the uh, workload management system. So uh, this is a service uh, which uh, a user is uh, using in order to uh, submit the jobs. The jobs are ending into in the central task queue, uh, 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 in the central task queue of the direct workload management system. Uh, there can be many users uh, in the community and uh, they are all uh, submitting uh, uh, their jobs which are different because the different requirements uh, with different properties and they are all end up in the central task queue of the direct workload management system. So um, uh, those jobs are accumulated in the central task queue and now it is time uh, to dispatch them uh, to the actual resources. So this is done uh, by a set of uh, uh, components that we call uh, pilot directors. Uh, these are, or uh, otherwise it, they can be called uh, pilot factories. Uh, these are uh, the components uh, which are specific for each uh, uh, computing uh, resource type, which are submitting uh, so-called pilot jobs, uh, which are uh, submitted as a regular jobs, uh, for example, regular grid jobs, uh, AG jobs uh, to the AGI resources and start to run uh, on the worker nodes uh, of a particular, of a, a particular uh, infrastructure. So uh, the pilot jobs uh, are submitted uh, to all the available resources uh, of the communities and once uh, they are submitted they start uh, to run and uh, these are the same uh, 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 job uh, for all the infrastructure. So once they are submitted, uh, so it doesn't matter anymore how they were submitted, 
they are all looking the same with respect to the central workload management system. So this is uh, the way how um, uh, the ever heterogeneous uh, resources uh, can be rendered as a homogeneous uh, pool of resources with respect uh, to the <coughs> central workload management. And uh, so pilot jobs, uh, uh, they are checking the environment and, uh, of the worker nodes and they're starting uh, to uh, uh, request uh, uh, jobs uh, from the central workload management system and uh, those jobs are dispatched uh, to the uh, pilot jobs uh, one by one and uh, uh, the pilot job uh, uh, controls the execution of the user payloads and when uh, uh, the payload, uh, uh, the, uh, the job is done, uh, the results are uploaded uh, to the central uh, sandboxes uh, of the workload management system. So that's it. So this is the principle of the pilot jobs uh, and uh, what are the advantages of uh, this way of uh, scheduling user payloads. Um, first, uh, and uh, uh, all the uh, payloads uh, from different users, production managers, they end up in the central task queue. And uh, this is in this central place. We can uh, efficiently and precisely uh, apply uh, the policies uh, of the whole uh, uh, community, of the whole virtual organization. So here the jobs can be ordered in uh, the order of their priorities. And when the pilots are picking up the jobs, they can pick up uh, uh, the jobs which are the highest priority jobs now. You can see uh, uh, this uh, uh, system as a huge batch system uh, where the priorities uh, can be applied uh, efficiently. And uh, so uh, in this case, uh, so the policies, um, uh, uh, this way of applying the policies dictates uh, that uh, we are using a multi-user uh, pilot jobs. So, so the pilot jobs which are submitted can pick up uh, the jobs of any user of uh, the community. And uh, uh, so this is uh, the paradigm which is uh, used by all the HEP experiments uh, now and uh, is well adopted, although it took some time uh, to, uh, to explain uh, why we need uh, this mode of operation. And uh, uh, Dirac is fully supporting this uh, mode uh, and um, uh, including all the security requirements uh, which are, uh, should be addressed in this case. Uh, the, uh, I will not go into uh, all the details uh, of uh, that, but if you will ask me questions afterwards, I, I will be happy to answer. On the other hand, uh, 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 as I said already, the pilot jobs are making all the different uh, computing infrastructures uh, homogeneous uh, with respect uh, to the central task queue. And so this is the way how uh, different resources can be seamlessly aggregated uh, together so that uh, from the uh, user perspective, uh, they just uh, see uh, logical sites uh, and uh, they don't really have to care about uh, different uh, ways uh, of uh, uh, submitting jobs uh, to a particular infrastructure. And uh, so this way, uh, uh, very different in nature, uh, computing resources can be uh, put together in a coherent system. So uh, from this point of view, uh, ah, by the way, I'm on this slide number 13. Um, Dirac has uh, all the necessary components uh, to uh, build um, uh, ad hoc uh, grid infrastructure. So we essentially we are speaking about the uh, overlay uh, layer on top of uh, various computing resources, uh, which is interconnecting uh, those computing resources in a seamless way. A seamless way. So this allows us uh, to speak about uh, the Dirac interware. So the interware. This is the term that was coined by one of the Dirac developers, uh, and uh, this is uh, how we are positioning uh, these uh, kind of uh, software now. So uh, this is the workload management system uh, and as I said it uh, gives access to various uh, uh, computing resources and uh, what are actual resources which are available to the Dirac users. So we are on the slide number 15. So uh, of course the Dirac was initially developed to focus on uh, using the computational grids 
And uh, so the WLCG grid resources uh, for the LCB collaboration was uh, the first uh, infrastructure where the zero was actually uh, intensively used. So from this point of view, of course, it fully supports uh, all the grids uh, which are based on the G-like middleware, so uh, WCG, AD, Gisela grid, and uh, some others, uh, using um, <coughs> uh, either G-like uh, uh, WMS uh, to access uh, the uh, grid sites or accessing the computing elements uh, directly. Uh, OSG uh, grid, which is American grid, which is also based on the Gillette middleware, is uh, also can be used uh, in the Zurich environment. The work is in progress uh, to support uh, uh, ARC middleware uh, and uh, the grids based on this uh, middleware, so most notably not, uh, not grid. And uh, we have already made a successful demonstration, uh, but. Uh, uh, since uh, the use of the resources is mostly driven by the users of the RAC, we don't have, uh, so far, we did not have uh, users uh, needing access to the node degree uh, resources, so uh, there was no intensive production use of the grid, but in principle it can be connected. And the other grid uh, can be supported as well if uh, there will be customers uh, needing that. Uh, another type of resources which are entering the game now are the cloud resources. So cloud is a buzzword of nowadays, and uh, so it looks to be the future of uh, distributed computing systems. So in Direct we have developed uh, uh, already uh, a couple of years ago a, a virtual machine a scheduler, which was developed in the context of the Bell 2 uh, of the Bell collaboration at CAC in Japan for the Monte Carlo production system. And uh, this uh, was a system which was uh, spawning dynamically virtual machines, uh, taking into account uh, the status uh, of the uh, task queue, and um, uh, uh, it, it was spawning virtual machines on the Amazon uh, commercial cloud. So the, uh, uh, the virtual machines uh, respond, taking into account the prices, uh, discarding the virtual machines uh, when no more needed. And uh, essentially it was using the same uh, schema that I have uh, uh, demonstrated uh, just a few minutes ago, just uh, that the pilot jobs are running inside the virtual machine, uh, which is uh, running in the cloud. And uh, from uh, the point uh, when the pilot job is starting the virtual machine, uh, so we are in exactly the same uh, situation as uh, we were uh, before. So uh, cloud resources are becoming the same uh, resource as any other. And uh, uh, the DRPM scheduler <coughs> uh, is uh, uh, capable to uh, deal with different cloud managers. Uh, uh, again, uh, by specialized uh, drivers or the directors, uh, which are submitting, in this case, virtual machines uh, to uh, cloud managers. Uh, we have uh, uh, access uh, to OCCI compliant clouds like OpenStack, OpenNebula, CloudStack, uh, Cloud Manager, and uh, Amazon EC2 uh, as well. So this is uh, a work uh, in progress. So the cloud uh, environment, and especially cloud for intensive computations, uh, are not yet uh, well established. Uh, so it is a very quickly moving uh, technology. And uh, uh, so uh, the VM Dirac uh, scheduler or uh, broker uh, is uh, uh, developed uh, as a multi-cloud broker so that we can have access to different clouds, uh, as I uh, just explained. And um, uh, it also uh, provides uh, a means uh, to uh, dynamically uh, allocate uh, virtual machines, uh, choosing uh, the right cloud, which is uh, most appropriate uh, for the given uh, uh, job requirements. And uh, uh, so this layer of scheduling uh, virtual machines is in full development now, and. Uh, uh, we are uh, adding new uh, different access methods uh, to different cloud managers uh, because uh, they are evolving. We are uh, adding different uh, uh, methods for contextualization of the virtual machines. Uh, they are also evolving. Uh, we are working on uh, virtual machine scheduling policies. And uh, in particular, this is the activity which we uh, uh, 
do as part of the AGA Cloud Task Force uh, activities. Uh, another kind of resources, uh, this is slide number 18, uh, is that uh, uh, there are quite a lot of uh, computing centers uh, which are not uh, uh, part of any particular grid uh, infrastructure. And uh, still uh, we have user communities we have, uh, that have uh, resources located uh, on those computer centers. And uh, of course, uh, it would be better to uh, use them coherently with other resources like grid resources. And for that, we uh, have a solution uh, um, of uh, using <coughs> uh, uh, such standalone uh, computing clusters, uh, uh, essentially uh, accessing it uh, with the uh, uh, SSH um, uh, tunnel uh, uh, so that uh, on the site it is enough only to create on the gateway machine uh, account which is accessible by SSH. And uh, so this account uh, will be used uh, by the specialized uh, pilot director, pilot factory, uh, which is fully integrated in the zero workload management system in order to access the batch uh, system of the computing cluster. So now we have uh, <coughs> solutions uh, like that uh, for clusters uh, based on the NSF, BACUS, uh, SunGrid Engine, uh, PBS Talk, and all the batch systems. And uh, now the work is ongoing uh, on more batch schedulers, uh, which is OR, SLOOM, uh, load level up. And um, uh, in this sense, uh, <coughs> uh, it is important to mention uh, that if even the jobs are submitted as a single uh, account on the gateway uh, machine, the user payloads are always executed uh, with the uh, real user, real owner credentials uh, of the payload. So no security compromises with respect uh, to the external services because the user uh, payloads can access uh, external storage elements, catalogs, or whatever other services, and they are properly authenticated and authorized in this case. Uh, slide uh, number uh, 19, just a couple of examples uh, of standalone computing clusters. Uh, so, for example, in LHCB, we are using a, a commercial uh, site, uh, uh, called Yandex, uh, which is provided uh, by a Russian commercial company, which has a talk uh, by system and uh, no grid middleware whatsoever. So, it is accessed by pure SSH, uh, and now it is the second largest uh, LHCB multiple color production site. So the other example is um, LRZ uh, Computing Center in Munich uh, that we have just uh, started to collaborate with. Uh, so it has a slurum by system. Uh, in, in addition, it has a ground f uh, five uh, computing el uh, element service. And uh, the gateway access uh, in this case is not SSH, but uh, GSI SSH, uh, but it is the same principle. And uh, it is uh, 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 it can provide uh, considerable resources for the biomed community. So this is the work in progress uh, that we are working on. Another example is a Mesa Center of uh, uh, Ex Marseille University. So there, there is a OR uh, system. Again, uh, it will be accessed by SSH. So. Uh, these are the main resources which are providing the bulk of the computing power to the user communities. But in principle, there are other types of resources uh, uh, that can be included. Uh, and examples uh, can be, for example, the LTB online filter farm, which is a very specific um, uh, computing farm uh, with no batch system uh, on it, uh, with no whatever grid middleware, with no, no SSH access, uh, but uh, this is fully integrated uh, into the uh, LETB multicolor production system uh, operated by Dirac uh, middleware. Another type of resources uh, is uh, volunteer grid based on uh, Boeing, uh, resource, uh, Boeing technology and uh, also with, together with virtualization. In particular, the uh, European desktop grid uh, uh, resources uh, uh, can be accessed uh, this way, and uh, so uh, this this is uh, the work in progress, and we are making a demonstration uh, right now. So uh, I would like to make here a side remark: is that Dirk attempts um, uh, to provide uh, access uh, to all types, to all kinds of resources and services, uh, which are 
uh, in principle available for uh, direct users and potential users. So at the same time, it also provides uh, its own solutions uh, like storage, uh, compute element, uh, catalogs, uh, transfer service. I will say a few words about that uh, later. But uh, by design, uh, the, these services, these resources uh, can be used together. So the computing resources I have already uh, told you, but uh, there are other uh, types of services like file catalogs uh, that uh, can be used uh, uh, in parallel, not necessarily replacing each other. And uh, uh, so this is uh, the goal and uh, the design principle uh, of uh, the Zurich uh, resource uh, management. And uh, so that uh, the final choice uh, of the services uh, is uh, left uh, to the user. So whatever is the best on the market, whether there, these are direct solutions or third-party solutions, uh, the user should be able to use. So a few words about uh, the direct data management. Uh, so we are in, at slide number 22. So uh, uh, direct includes data management uh, components, uh, which are uh, first of all, uh, uh, the services which are giving access to the storages, so storage elements. So, of course, it is fully supporting uh, the Zulite uh, uh, storage elements uh, with the standard SRM interface. Uh, so, uh, this is the storage element which is uh, accessing actual, uh, 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 making transfers using grid FTP protocol, uh, using uh, Logos libraries, and uh, uh, as such, it is limited uh, to uh, a uh, subset of uh, uh, platforms and uh, uh, so this is a well-established uh, storage element and uh, we give ex access uh, to the uh, on, at the same time we have uh, a solution direct proper solution for the storage elements which is based uh, on the direct uh, uh, proprietary uh, protocol um, and uh, uh, from this point of view uh, it is uh, a simpler uh, solution it doesn't allow certain things like uh, third party transfers. Uh, on the other hand, uh, it is optimized, for example, uh, for storing uh, small files, and uh, uh, we are working on making it uh, even uh, uh, more versatile, including the third party transfers. Of course, uh, uh, all the accesses are, are secure with the standard uh, grid uh, security mechanism. Other storage elements can be included uh, as a front-end uh, services uh, to various uh, um, uh, file service uh, based on FTP, uh, SFTP, HTTP, uh, or whatever other uh, uh, protocols um, <coughs> uh, uh, as a storage uh, service. Uh, so, uh, uh, in the data management, uh, we have to store data, but we have to find this data afterwards. So, this is uh, done by means of the file catalog, uh, and uh, from this point of view, Bureauk uh, is uh, uh, having full support uh, for <coughs> the usage of the FACTA standard uh, grid uh, catalog, which is LCG file catalog. And uh, on the other hand, it has its own uh, file catalog solution, which again is built uh, in the Direct framework, and uh, this is part of the Direct standard services. So it is uh, uh, using a MySQL database uh, as a backend, and uh, it uh, has uh, a number of uh, client tools, uh, common line, the specialized shell, and the Python API. And uh, what makes it different uh, compared uh, to the LCG file catalog is that it has full support uh, for the user metadata. So from this point of view, it uh, provides also a, a functionality similar to the ANGA metadata service. So from this point of view, the file catalog uh, has uh, uh, the functionality equivalent to combined of LEC and ANGA. And uh, in principle, uh, and there can be more catalogs uh, included. Uh, for example, in LETB, we have developed uh, uh, several specific uh, catalogs uh, in the same framework uh, as uh, Europe catalog, uh, which are used uh, for the production system of LETB. Uh, we can also consider other catalogs to be wrapped the same way. So, for example, we are contemplating the catalog which is available in the IROTS uh, system. Here again, I want uh, to make a side remark is um, uh, slide number 24. Uh, 
uh, that for direct users, uh, the use of any storage element of file catalog is transparent. Uh, so uh, we have an abstraction layer, which is um, on top of different uh, catalog implementations, uh, which are uh, hiding uh, the uh, uh, diversity of the underlying services. And uh, for the users uh, of DRAP, uh, these are logical entities, essentially, logical storage elements or logical file catalogs. And this is the pattern that uh, we apply, as you have uh, already seen everywhere. So this is this overlay structure that makes uh, the heterogeneous services and resources homogeneous for the direct users. Uh, so uh, we have uh, services, we have resources uh, to use. Uh, now users have to access uh, those resources. So what interfaces are available for the uh, direct users? Slide number 26. So uh, the main uh, uh, interface uh, uh, tool for the uh, direct users uh, is uh, the web portal, web portal, uh, direct web portal. Uh, that uh, allows uh, users uh, to do uh, all the interactions uh, uh, with the grid resources. So it is um, uh, built uh, using uh, modern uh, web uh, portal building uh, uh, tools. Uh, and uh, uh, the goal is uh, to provide uh, uh, an intuitive uh, desktop-like application uh, interface uh, uh, to, the, uh, to the users so that uh, uh, all the uh, widgets and buttons on, on this uh, interface uh, are intuitively clear how to use. So by means of this interface, uh, users can monitor and control all the activities, uh, uh, all the, uh, for example, uh, registration, uh, uploading proxies, uh, which are necessary to uh, uh, do some operations on behalf of the users. Uh, uh, submitting the jobs, monitoring uh, and uh, manipulating the jobs, uh, downloading the results, uh, manipulating data, including downloads of the data uh, through the uh, web. And uh, of course, uh, the direct systems itself uh, can be all configured and managed uh, through the web interface. So this is the tool also for the direct administrators. The access to the web portal is uh, secure using standard grid certificates uh, with the fine-grained authorization rules, so there are no, again, uh, security compromises here. So on slide 27, uh, there are just a few examples uh, of uh, different uh, views uh, in the web portal. So uh, there are tools uh, for, for example, uploading proxies, submitting jobs, uh, to uh, having access to various accounting plots, uh, monitoring of your jobs, uh, and uh, so on and so forth. Um, slide number 28. Uh, so uh, these are, this is the web portal, which is uh, direct proper, but uh, uh, it is built uh, on top of uh, a framework uh, which is direct internally used uh, for its web portal. And in principle, this same fra framework uh, uh, can be used uh, for building specific uh, pages, uh, specific uh, for uh, particular applications. And uh, so the pages which are built uh, for the direct proper can be used uh, as an example of that. In order to uh, provide um, <clears throat> uh, uh, application web portals uh, uh, access uh, to the zero functionality in the language neutral uh, way, uh, we have uh, introduced recently uh, the RESTful interface uh, to direct services uh, so that this is the interface which is suitable uh, to be used uh, with portal written in whatever language, in Java, PHP, and uh, so on. And uh, so, as I said, the web interface is, uh, the, uh, is considered to be the main one, but uh, other interfaces are also available. So there is an extensive uh, Python API, for example, all the direct software is written in Python. And for example, this API is used by the Gunga user front end, uh, very well known tool. And uh, also there is a rich set of the common line tools uh, with more than 200 commands uh, <coughs> uh, defined. So uh, all these, all these interfaces uh, or services uh, are written in the, uh, developed in the DIRC development framework. 
uh, slide number 30. <laughs> and, uh, and this uh, framework <coughs> consists uh, of uh, uh, well-defined com uh, components and uh, recipes uh, how to do uh, the development work. And uh, <coughs> uh, so that uh, uh, new functionality can be developed uh, essentially by providing uh, uh, extensions uh, to the core services and uh, plugins uh, uh, which can be uh, provided, uh, uh, which are placeholders for which are provided in various uh, uh, places of the core uh, services. And uh, all the communications between the distributed components uh, are secure uh, with the standard uh, grid uh, security standards based on X509 and GSI security structure, uh, uh, infrastructure. And uh, uh, there are fine-grained uh, authorization rules uh, uh, that can be defined. Uh, so, and this is built in uh, the protocol in the framework. So the users uh, uh, or developers developing against their framework, they don't have to care about these basic uh, properties. So the framework includes um, uh, uh, basic services that are necessary, absolutely necessary to build distributed computing systems. And in particular, so it has a uh, redundant configuration service, which is serving uh, configuration parameters so to all the distributed components, uh, and uh, it is uh, on purpose done uh, redundant in a redundant way, so that uh, if uh, some components are failing in the configuration service, still the configuration data is available uh, um, from some other redundant components, so it is always uh, available. So. We have a full-featured proxy management system, and this is a must in the distributed computing environment. We have a system login service, which is an essential tool for the administrators to see the status, the behavior of the system. Monitoring service to monitor the behavior of all the components. Security login to keep traces of all the interactions of client and services. Just an example, slide number 32, an example of the Bell 2 experiment uh, in Keck uh, that it has uh, um, uh, uh, distributed service, uh, Dirac services, uh, so their system is based on uh, uh, Dirac, uh, so that they have uh, Dirac servers which are uh, situated in uh, Keck in Japan, and I have in Beijing in China, and uh, in uh, IFG Institute uh, in Poland. Uh, so. Uh, this way, they achieve uh, the redundancy and the readability of the direct service. Uh, another uh, base system uh, that uh, uh, is uh, available to direct users is accounting of all the uh, operations. Uh, and uh, there are uh, various uh, 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 accounting data and plots uh, that can be uh, 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 available for the Jira users. So here, you, uh, on slide number 32, uh, 33, you have uh, uh, several examples. And uh, uh, so all these uh, plots are, in addition, uh, are of publication ready quality so that uh, you can uh, pick it up and put in your slides uh, directly. And the plugin service, by the way, is also available for the users uh, with their own data. Uh, so these are, this is the middleware. This is what is Dirac is offering. So who are uh, the Dirac users? So the first, of course, uh, 30, site number 35 uh, is the daily TB collaboration. And uh, so this is uh, the primary and the most, uh, 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 the largest uh, user of the Dirac software. So uh, on this slide, uh, you see the snapshot of the last month activity uh, of LHCB. Uh, so it, it shows that uh, the scalability of the system is such that it can run up to 40k concurrent jobs on more than 100 sites. Uh, so the LHCB system uh, is using uh, the Dirac installation uh, which includes about 10 mid-range service uh, as central services. And uh, still there are uh, further optimizations are possible to increase uh, the capacity. So the capacity of the system is quite good. So uh, slide number 36. So LHCB is, of course, an example of a, a rather complicated, uh, complex uh, use uh, of the direct services. So for example, the LHCB production system 
is based uh, on the direct components, uh, in particular on the direct transformation system, but it provides uh, a lot of uh, extensions and uh, custom plugins uh, to, to the system in order to uh, cope uh, with the VCB specific workflows. In particular, so this production system <coughs> is uh, um, performing a data driven. Uh, generation of the jobs of the payloads and uh, uh, so that uh, the jobs are automatically submitted as soon as the data is arriving or the data replication tasks uh, can be created uh, uh, as soon as uh, the data to replicate is available. And uh, LHCB is also using specific uh, uh, templates and catalogs uh, in order to support uh, these workflows all uh, built in the DIRAC framework. Uh, another, experiment, another example is about to experiment. This was uh, the first experiment which was using uh, uh, DIRAC outside uh, LHCB. So it was uh, chosen as a basis for the computing model of the second uh, phase of the experiment, so which is expecting quite a decent uh, uh, data acquisition rate of about two gigabytes per second. And uh, uh, the peculiarity of Bell is that uh, it is using a combination of non-grid and grid sites uh, uh, and commercial clouds. And uh, so, uh, as you see, uh, Bell uh, two grid resources include uh, both WOCG and OSG, uh, OSG grids, uh, as well as computing CAC computing center, which is not uh, the grid uh, site, uh, as well as Amazon EC2 cloud, uh, as uh, I already mentioned. <coughs> So uh, Bell, uh, two people were particularly uh, interested in the Direct Scalability tests, and they have uh, done uh, quite an intensive uh, testing of the Direct Scalability properties. And in particular, they have made a demonstration of uh, using Direct uh, with the rate uh, of uh, more than half a million jobs per day. So this is uh, uh, largely enough uh, for the current uh, Bell to meet and for uh, future Bell to meet. <clears throat> so there are other Bureau dedicated installations, uh, uh, for example, the installation for the ILC clicker uh, um, uh, collaboration, which is used uh, uh, for its uh, production system, for mostly for the Monte Carlo simulations. And in particular, for example, the Direct Power Catalog was actually developed uh, to meet uh, the requirements of this collaboration. Another example is the best uh, experiment in IHEP in China. Uh, so for the phase uh, three of the experiment, this uh, Direct was used, uh, was chosen. And uh, so it is also using the Direct uh, data management uh, component. In particular, they have uh, made a very thorough test of uh, comparison of uh, uh, Direct Power Catalog versus Honga uh, service, and uh, they have found it uh, as a comparable performance. Another example is the CTA, uh, Cherenkov Telescope Array, uh, large co collaboration, <coughs> which is um, uh, using Direct now. So what is interesting about CTA is that they are, have started uh, as a, a customer of the France Grid Direct uh, uh, service, uh, which is not a dedicated CTA installation that uh, I will uh, say a few words uh, just after. And uh, after evaluation of the Direct, uh, they have decided uh, to make their own dedicated installation at uh, Peak Computing Center in Barcelona. So in particular, CTA is using uh, complex workflows, uh, which is uh, also have a support in the Direct framework. <coughs> Uh, another example of the uh, DIRA community, slide number 40, is the Biomed community, which is, uh, has uh, quite a lot of, uh, uh, quite a number of different groups. Uh, and um, so this is uh, the diagram uh, from the AB counting uh, database, uh, which uh, shows uh, that now uh, almost, well, let's say roughly 30% of the biomed uh, community uh, payload is going through DIRAC. Uh, another interesting example for the uh, biomed community, slide number 41, is the project which is called Virtual Imaging Platform, uh, which is um, a project to uh, provide a, a web portal uh, for the uh, users of the applications uh, which are dealing with medical image uh, simulation. Uh, so this platform was created in Creative Lab and Young. And uh, so uh, this uh, platform uh, uh, is uh, operating a web uh, portal and the Webflow engine, which is actually generating uh, the uh, user jobs. Uh, 
but uh, the, uh, after that, uh, the uh, workflow engine is interfaced uh, to the Jira workload management system, and uh, this is taking care of uh, provisioning the resources uh, and um, uh, uh, and uh, so uh, this is an example of how the application portals can be. Uh, used uh, in conjunction with the direct uh, workload management system. And uh, the last uh, topic, uh, subtopic uh, of uh, my presentation is uh, using uh, Direct uh, as a service. So uh, Direct uh, uh, client uh, is uh, easy uh, to install and uh, typically this is a part of our usual tutorial, for example. But the direct services, even if they are not so difficult to install, still they need a dedicated hardware for hosting, configuration, maintenance, which needs experts, experts to do. And so it needs monitoring of the computing resources which are made available for these services. So this is not that an easy exercise. And small user communities certainly can't support maintaining dedicated direct services. Uh, still, they need the integrated access. So what is the solution? So the solution can be that large grid infrastructures uh, can provide uh, direct services uh, for their users so that they don't need to install these services themselves. So slide number 44. So example of such uh, direct service is uh, a front, uh, service which is provided by the uh, France, uh, French uh, National Grid Initiative, uh, French uh, segment of the AG uh, infrastructure. <clears throat> and uh, so this uh, service essentially started as a support uh, for user tutorials and then uh, we found out that, that this can be uh, useful for the users in their practical uh, work. And on the other hand, uh, there were several regional and university campus installations in France uh, 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 but uh, the complexity of maintenance of the services uh, uh, made us uh, 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 to join efforts uh, so that uh, uh, to provide uh, a single uh, direct service uh, in France uh, uh, on the national level. And uh, so those universities which were providing direct services before uh, combinedly uh, provide, uh, now uh, made up a team uh, which is uh, providing a direct service which is hosted now by the uh, computing center in Lyon. This is a T1 center in the WCG sense. And uh, so this is the service uh, which is um, uh, uh, hosted in Lyon and managed uh, by a distributed team of uh, service administrators uh, which are coming from uh, five participating universities uh, that uh, have gained experience uh, with running direct services. So uh, slide number 45, uh, uh, so services uh, in uh, computing uh, center in Lyon, this uh, front free Dirac service includes the basic services, the uh, workload management as I have described, and uh, uh, basic data management uh, uh, for the um, user, uh, uh, usual user jobs. So they have uh, provided access uh, to the grid resources, uh, to the uh, storage resources. Uh, it, uh, uh, the data management uh, services provide also uh, direct file catalog, replica catalog, and metadata catalog services uh, as I have described. So this service is uh, having the web portal and uh, it also provides the REST interface so that uh, in principle application portals can uh, uh, program against uh, uh, these uh, services using the REST interface. Slide number 46, uh, so the main uh, users uh, of the France Gris uh, direct service uh, uh, are, uh, so there are numerous users already now, so there are about 15 uh, virtual organizations registered and uh, 88 users registered. So not all of them, of course, are active, uh, but uh, uh, most of the uh, uh, jobs, uh, most of the activities uh, are coming from the Biomed community. In particular, there is uh, one robot uh, uh, user 
uh, corresponding to the uh, virtual imaging platform that I have uh, mentioned uh, is uh, providing a big portion of uh, the payload uh, of this service. So this service is in production since uh, May <clears throat> 2012, so less than a year ago. And uh, already now it has already uh, about 3 million jobs uh, that went through the system. So as I said, mostly from, uh, from the Bionet applications. So uh, this is also uh, the service which is used uh, heavily for the user tutorials. And um, uh, so uh, this is, uh, these are the tutorials uh, that we are running uh, from time to time, which are using uh, the resources uh, of the virtual organization of uh, transformation. Uh, so this is the virtual organization devoted to the training activities. So, for example, the movie that you see uh, on the, the right uh, is uh, just a result of the exercise which is uh, uh, executed by uh, students of those tutorials. Uh, so that each frame is a separate uh, in this movie is a separate grid job, uh, providing the image and then uh, collecting these images uh, in this movie. So uh, we have. Uh, 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 support also in this France Green uh, direct service. Uh, we have support uh, for particular applications, uh, <clears throat> and uh, uh, we are trying to pay attention to help importing the applications to the grid. And uh, for example, the new communities uh, that want to try out uh, direct uh, for their production systems, uh, they can use uh, this service uh, just uh, to get uh, the first impression, to get. Uh, uh, idea about the functionality provided. So, for example, we have uh, now uh, Fermilat uh, large um, uh, array of telescopes, uh, LSST, SuperD, uh, SuperD probably is uh, dropped already. But uh, these experiments uh, are uh, registered in the country service and uh, they are doing their tests and demonstrations uh, now using the service. So uh, slide number 48 is just a snapshot of yesterday's activity of the France uh, uh service. So you see the usual nightly drop of activities. Uh, and uh, so it shows you that the service is actually alive. So it was not uh, the most active uh, day yesterday, maybe. But uh, you can see uh, that uh, there are user jobs uh, which are running at about 50 sites uh, in the service. <coughs> Uh, so, in principle, uh, we are providing the basic uh, direct services, but uh, if uh, need would be, we can provide also uh, more advanced services uh, following the user demands. In particular, we can provide a transformation service, a replication service. Uh, these are the services which are uh, part of the direct core software and which are used for automated job submission and data replication. We can uh, provide uh, uh, support uh, for data integrity inspection, user storage, uh, consumption accounting, which is uh, 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 very often a, 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 a rather complicated task. Uh, we can uh, uh, provide support for the NPI jobs. Uh, so I was not mentioning a special support for NPI jobs uh, in a direct uh, framework. Uh, but uh, we have uh, a stage, so if you will ask me questions, I can ask. I can give a bit more details. And uh, also, in principle, this service can host uh, some services which are developed for a particular uh, community in the same framework as uh, Europe. So uh, just uh, a few details uh, that the France Grid uh, Direct Service uh, is um, uh, uh, hosted uh, by the uh, Computing Center in Lyon, and uh, we have uh, six virtual <coughs> service, uh, service uh, which are running the main uh, uh, direct services, and uh, we are also using the MySQL server provided by the uh, Computing Center itself, so we are not operating itself ourselves. And uh, um, we have uh, some redundant uh, services outside the uh, Computing Center in Lyon, in Marseille, and in other lab uh, in Creatis, uh, just for redundancy, especially for the configuration service. So uh, there are other, uh, so this is the main, uh, uh, the most prominent example of uh, direct national service. There are other examples as well already. So uh, there was a uh, Dirac uh, was provided as a service for Gisela Latin American Green uh, Grid, uh, but uh, uh, and it was 
in production uh, since 2010, but uh, uh, these uh, uh, infrastructures uh, virtually stop now, and uh, its services are now provided by France Grid. So it is <coughs> an example of merging uh, the two uh, services into just one. So for the Gisele users, uh, nothing has changed. They don't see even the change. So there is another example of uh, Ibergrid, uh, which is a Spanish uh, national grid infrastructure, which is providing now the direct service as well, although it is not that actively used. And uh, there are other <coughs> uh, projects uh, that uh, are under discussion or construction, uh, even uh, in uh, China, in uh, Russia, in Italy, to provide similar service to France Grid uh, directly. So, uh, as a uh, uh, slide number 52, so the uh, the success of the Paris Gris uh, uh, direct service uh, shows that uh, direct can uh, bring uh, uh, clear advantages uh, to the users and the user communities that need uh, access to the uh, massive uh, computations uh, on the grid. So in particular, this is especially well seen the, during the user tutorials. And uh, so, from this point of view, we think uh, that uh, this can be a very useful facility, a very useful service uh, for uh, other users of other grid infrastructures uh, uh, on the national level and uh, on the uh, European grid infrastructure as a project as a whole. I arrive to my conclusions. Uh, so, uh, uh, the computational grids. Uh, now are uh, not something uh, uh, strange, not something exotic, and uh, uh, they are needed for the daily work for many users and various applications. And uh, the experience which is uh, acquired uh, by high energy physics experiment uh, uh, and the tools uh, that were developed uh, for those experiments now can be shared with the users in other domains, uh, in other scientific uh, uh, communities. So DIRUC uh, is providing a framework uh, uh, for building distributed computing systems, which is uh, based on all the experience which is accumulated uh, uh, with the high energy physics facility experiment. And it has a rich, uh, uh, I can say, a complete uh, set of uh, services which are ready to use uh, by the users. So this is used now by a number of direct service projects on the regional and national levels. And, um, uh, so uh, services based on the Europe technologies uh, can really help users to get started in the world of distributed computations. Uh, and uh, this is the way how this uh, world can reveal all its full potential to the users. That's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andre. That was a, a really comprehensive and interesting um, chat. Um, I guess it's now time to open up the floor to um, to all our guest listeners. Um, David Meredith, I can see you've uh, primed your microphone already. Thanks, Andre. That was a, was a great presentation. I very much enjoyed that. Um, two small questions. Um, <clears throat> on slide 27, um, it wasn't immediately clear to me when you upload the proxy. Um, whether you're uploading the P12 and generating the proxy on the server, or you're generating the proxy on the client and then, you know, just accessing the P12 file using using your client there, and, and generating the proxy on the client and uploading the proxy is is it the is it the latter? Okay, so in this case, uh, uh, the certificate which is available on the client machine uh, and as a, in a P12 uh, form. Is yes, it is uploaded uh, to the uh, direct server through the uh, HTTPS uh, secure connection, and uh, uh, so the actual proxy is generated on the server machine on behalf of the user. And uh, as soon as it is generated and uploaded uh, to the uh, proxy manager, which is keeping the proxy, it's uh, pretty much like my proxy service. I think the rules are changing slightly, then uh, that they're relaxing, but. Um... I'm not sure we'd be allowed to do that in uh, the UK. I, I don't know. I'd have to look into that. Yeah, this is a delicate uh, point, in fact. And you are right that uh, uh, things are relaxing. So before, yeah, example, yeah. things like robot certificates, uh, we, can't, we could not think about. But now sure. the uh, uh, certificate identities uh, that allows uh, to work on behalf of uh, other users. So uh, things are relaxing, and uh, uh, this is done, I, I think it is on purpose, because uh, yes, uh, uh, 
with many more users involved, uh, the security constraints are starting to be really limited. Limiting. Okay. Uh, um, secondly, um, I guess on the same slide, yeah. Um, you've got support for JDL files there. Um, I know you mentioned other grid middleware, um, but have you? Um, are you planning to support other kind of job description languages such as JSDL and BES and uh, the parameter sweep extensions for uh, JSDL? Uh, okay, uh, we, we haven't thought about that. Uh, even about uh, the JDL. So the JDL uh, is somehow the heritage uh, for Direct. So. Uh, GDL, yes, this is a standard uh, way of describing the jobs uh, in, um, uh, well, in Conda, in uh, Gilead uh, world. Uh, inside uh, Direct, we don't use uh, GDLs anymore, so we are not using GDL uh, uh, machinery, for example, for matching resources and uh, job requirements. So inside Direct, we have our own description uh, of jobs, which are which is optimized uh, for uh, for the matching work, uh, for example. So from this point of view, uh, the approach of Direct uh, is uh, to adapt uh, to, to whatever is uh, useful for the user. So uh, we are transforming, for example, GDL in our internal uh, representation. Uh, so I'm pretty sure that in a similar way, we can transform other ways of uh, job description into the Direct uh, uh, internal uh, representation. But uh, for, from the user perspective, if uh, they are accustomed to, to use uh, some particular sure, sure. Uh, so this will be seen as if uh, uh, they, are, they can use their native uh, way of describing the jobs. Okay, that's great. So do you, do you publish your proprietary job description format anywhere? Oh, not really. Uh, right. But we can do, I think. Okay. Thanks, that's it for me. Uh, anybody else have a question for um, Andrea at this stage? Yes, I would. Uh, this is Helmut. Uh, Helmut from uh, Lovers in, in Europe and Leibniz Super Computing Center. Yes, hi. Um, in your initial slides, you addressed some of the uh, basic problems that users faced and why Direct was developed. But um, actually, in our experience, unfortunately, I really have to say that there is an even more basic problem for quite a few users, and that is to obtain an X509 certificate in the first place. Um, have you also encountered this problem? Uh, I would say that uh, any list of problems uh, with the grid uh, or distributed computing will not be exhausted. This is certainly true. And in particular, yeah, this is true that uh, getting a, a grid certificate uh, uh, for in many cases for many user communities, especially for those which are not really very used to work uh, with the computing, uh, so this this is uh, this can be a problem. So that's why uh, there are so many uh, now initiatives uh, to build uh, community portals application portals uh, which are uh, using different authentication methods uh, than uh, uh, using the certificates uh, and uh, uh, then uh, uh, they are using uh, 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 robot certificates for example to actually access uh, the grid uh, resources so it looks like uh, the pattern which is uh, uh, emerging now, which is uh, uh, which is very widely used now. So, from this point of view, <clears throat> uh, when I was mentioning uh, the Direct REST interface, uh, so in principle, uh, uh, this REST interface uh, is uh, accepting uh, the authentication of the users uh, using the OAuth 2 based uh, uh, standard uh, based uh, uh, ways of uh, user authentication. Okay, so uh, in this sense, uh, uh, there can be different other methods uh, uh, of user authentication which can be translated in the uh, um, uh, grid security certificate uh, for the robot uh, users which are uh, representing uh, the users of the, uh, of the portal. And uh, this probably partly answers uh, your question. So from this point of view, from the user perspective, there can be uh, simpler ways. Uh, it can depend on the particular uh, portal application. Uh, um, uh, so uh, the authentication mechanism uh, can be 
chosen by this portal and then translated uh, into the grid standard uh, 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 authentication mechanism uh, by means of this intermediary of uh, robot uh, user. So this is the way how it can be addressed. So from this point of view, uh, we are supporting uh, <coughs> uh, this uh, old mechanism uh, to facilitate uh, but uh, uh, I don't think that there is a single bullet and uh, some very easy magical uh, uh, mechanism now. But uh, if uh, there are some, uh, we will be happy to, to consider that as well. Um, I have a second question. Um, you're using this pilot uh, job framework and um, I'm also working in a resource center and um, I wanted to know why um, are you not just submitting the jobs directly to the resource instead of going through that pilot job? What is the reason? Okay, so thank you for this question. So there are a whole lot of reasons uh, for that. Uh, uh, and uh, this is what I tried to, to explain uh, uh, partly uh, in the, uh, when I was describing the workload management. From the very beginning, the main reason was uh, 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 how to reduce uh, the number of failures uh, that users are experiencing uh, in the grid environment. So especially when uh, in the early grid, uh, when uh, it was not uh, very stable, uh, but grid is never stable. Everything uh, is changing all the time. So the jobs, uh, the users were experiencing a lot of uh, job failures, uh, so the efficiencies of the jobs uh, were not uh, very high and uh, uh, most of the failures of the user jobs were happening at the start of the job because uh, the environment for the jobs for example were not uh, 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 quite suitable quite good uh, so the data was not available the software was not available some libraries were not available or whatever so the pilot job uh, uh, since it is running before actually the payload uh, of the uh, user is uh, requested can uh, uh, make extensive checks of the environment on the resource or the worker node uh, that it has grabbed. And uh, so it can detect uh, that the environment is uh, not sane, and in this case, it will not even take uh, the user payload. So the user will not see the failure. Okay, so the uh, insane environment, uh, uh, workload, uh, worker nodes with insane environment will uh, be failed before the user sees the problem. Okay, so this was uh, the initial um, idea how to uh, manage uh, these uh, failure rates, uh, contain it uh, uh, to a reasonable value. But in the, uh, also there are a lot of other uh, advantages now. So this is what I tried to explain. So uh, for example, the pilots which are running in your uh, computing center or the pilot which is running in the desktop grid uh, uh, machine, so this pilot uh, job is exactly the same. So from this point of view, uh, uh, in order, uh, if you want to aggregate all these different resources into a single system, essentially the only thing you have to do is uh, to provide a mechanism to schedule all the same, very simple jobs, which is a pilot job, uh, uh, to uh, find a mechanism to uh, dispatch this pilot job to a particular uh, computing resource. So this is a relatively simple exercise, and this is uh, the way how uh, you can combine uh, very different uh, resources into a single coherent system from the user uh, perspective, okay? And uh, from this point of view, pilot uh, jobs are really a solution uh, for the problem like uh, interoperability in between the different infrastructures. So I haven't heard about uh, really a successful uh, solution to interoperability problems in between the clouds and between the different grids. In this case, uh, uh, instead of interoperability in between different infrastructures, you put this overlay structure, yeah? So you are submitting uh, uh, pilot jobs, uh, the same pilot jobs to different infrastructure, and you make all these different infrastructure coherent from the user point of view. So there is a lot of uh, sense uh, in this uh, pilot paradigm. I I understand it. It all makes it look a little bit more homogeneous, but uh, I mean, you still have the problem that you may have to compile your user application, your payload, for the specific architecture that you are running on. Ah, from this point of view, it is the same problem as uh, uh, with submitting directly to the 
uh, uh, to the um, uh, computing resources, I mean uh, submitting user jobs to the user resource. So uh, in this workload management, even if it is a, a workload management with kind of jobs, uh, user jobs are specifying their requirements in terms of uh, how much CPU they need, which platform they need, uh, whatever else, okay? And uh, so this uh, specification of the user uh, job requirement should be met uh, when actually uh, matching the resource capacity to the user job. So from this point of view, it is very similar to uh, the standard uh, grid workload management system. When yep. a pilot is picking up a user job, it presents the capacity of the site on which it is running. And at this moment, uh, only those jobs that are eligible to run on this uh, site uh, can be picked up by this pilot, okay? So from this point of view, uh, this uh, stays uh, uh, the same as uh, with the standard grid uh, workload management schedule. In the pilot jobs, um, you definitely need the outgoing internet connectivity from the worker nodes where the Absolutely. pilot job is running. And this is a problem because, for instance, at our resource center, for uh, security reasons, uh, this connectivity is often uh, blocked. Yeah, yeah, this is uh, uh, this is really a problem at, at some centers. I can say that uh, all the grid sites, uh, all the sites which are participating in the grid infrastructure, they do have this outbound connectivity. They just can't function without that. Okay, and uh, uh, so we are speaking here about distributed computing. And uh, so distributed computing, it means uh, that uh, the actual activities are controlled uh, by uh, some services which are external to the resources. So uh, from this point of view, if a, a, a computing center like what you have just mentioned is completely closed uh, with respect to the uh, uh, external uh, services, uh, so essentially, yeah, it is at least very difficult to, to include it into the distributed uh, infrastructure, although not impossible. Uh, outbound connectivity, and this is uh, essential, so that this is only outbound connectivity which is necessary. So, and uh, the connections are secure with the GSI uh, standards. Okay, so from this point of view, Security-wise, I don't think uh, that uh, there are really problems, but there they can be administrative uh, restrictions or uh, so rules uh, which are adopted on the sites and so on. In this uh, particular case, in principle, uh, we are not using this pattern very often, but uh, in principle, it is possible to make um, a, a zero gateway. We have a, a, a component which is called gateway, uh, which is essentially a proxy for all the uh, direct protocol, uh, client service protocol uh, communications. So uh, such a proxy service uh, can be put uh, on the gateway of the site, which is otherwise not allowing outbound connectivity. And then uh, all these uh, connections uh, that are necessary to run user jobs, uh, they can go through this proxy service. Although, of course, uh, this is not the recommended way, and if uh, outbound connectivity can be uh, uh, can be done can be made available, this is certainly better. Thank you, Andre. I, we have the next question. Hi, this is Chiri. I have a more technical question. You have different types of resources, and for each type of resource, you have pilot one pilot director. So is it up to user to decide which resource he or she wants to use, or is it then on the level of matching service that the user job comes to either EGE or NDG? Okay, so yeah, this is uh, uh, in fact a very important uh, uh, issue, important question, especially uh, for uh, the direct as a service which is uh, serving uh, multiple uh, user groups, uh, user communities. There should be a way uh, to define uh, which resources are available for each uh, for which uh, community, and uh, so that uh, uh, the resources which are not belonging to uh, community A can't be uh, used uh, by community B. So, uh, in this sense, uh, in the uh, direct uh, configuration uh, uh, system, uh, there is a full description of all the resources which are available for uh, those uh, for the users of this uh, direct infrastructure. And uh, uh, so you can specify for each resource uh, which community can actually access this 
uh, resource. And uh, so this will be uh, strictly taken into account uh, when scheduling pilots, uh, when the pilots are picking up user jobs, so that uh, user uh, will not uh, use the resources which are not belonging to, to his uh, community. On the other hand, uh, each particular individual user can uh, specify in the jobs, uh, for example, which uh, particular resource uh, they want uh, to use. And uh, this will be also taken into account. So you can specify, for example, sites on which uh, your jobs uh, should be running. So then only those sites will be considered. So there are uh, various ways uh, to address that. Uh, and uh, so this is uh, uh, fully taken into account. Thank you very much for that, um, Andre. If there are no other questions, I'll um, put Sergei on the line for you. Andre, thank you very much for the excellent presentation. I have one question about uh, whether the French view installation that is on slide 47, whether that can be used by anyone to try their account. Can I just go there and get an account? If I have a certificate, so, uh, the France Gris installation uh, is uh, operated by the France uh, Gris uh, NGI uh, by uh, this uh, project. So, from this point of view, uh, in principle, there is uh, uh, Gilles Mathieu uh, is uh, online, so uh, who is the manager of the France Gris project. So, I, I think it would be better that probably he answers that. Technically, there is no problem uh, that. Uh, you can try this out and you can be registered, uh, but uh, uh, this is, uh, let's say, uh, uh, relations in between the user or user community that wants to try out uh, Dirac and the France Gris uh, project. So I was uh, here presenting rather the technical details and how it is uh, working. So uh, how uh, to uh, agree on um, the use uh, of this service uh, this should be a, a negotiation in between uh, the users of a particular community uh, with the France Gris uh, project, I would say. So this is not a direct problem proper. So Gilles, uh, can you comment? Okay. So um, yes, the the as as Andre said, the uh, question is absolutely not technical. It's a question of process. Uh, this French instance is in production since um, well mostly a year now, we can say in, in, in sort of a pre-production and then production uh, for a set of pilot communities. And uh, one of the prerequisites for using the instance is the fact that the community that uses the service um, provides its own support for the tool, uh, for the use of, of, of Dirac. So this is why we have, uh, with the initial set of videos that we support, uh, there was someone involved in this team of uh, rotating administrators in France. So uh, the, um, the different communities that we support have supporters, people that can help users within the instance. Um, most of the use uh, was well initially um, set for users working in, in France, but this is not uh, this is less and less true now because of uh, support for views like Biomed that uh, Andre presented. And then, of course, in Biomed, we have international users. And then this gets extended beyond the, um, the boundaries of, uh, of only French users. Now, the question is uh, how to process to uh, use this instance more widely. And we have not defined yet a process to achieve that, but I think this is something that needs discussion if there is an interest um, for international communities to use the service uh, at a wider scale, then of course we in France are well ready to discuss this and to uh, discuss the uh, how how we could open the instance to more users. Um, and what are the uh, prerequisites for this, and uh, what is what is the model behind this uh, providing this service? So I'm more than happy to uh, to be involved in discussions uh, about how we could move forward uh, if needed, so that the service, the instance, is opened more widely. And what would that mean in terms of involvement for 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 France and uh, from EGI and and the like? Thank you for a clear answer. I, 
I have in mind more 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 the representatives of communities. So instead of letting complete communities to use the instance, just to have a, a testing account or try the service yourself account that I can just go there and have some limited capacity, some limited capabilities, really just to have a feel of what the rock is for. Uh, because I think that the typical use case for a, before a community can commit itself to any tool, they want the technologies from the community to go and try out the system. So my question was more about whether Dirac has an installation anywhere around the world where such a community representative can just go there and try the system in an hour and provide feedback to its own community afterwards. Well, yes, just just to to, to clarify, I mean the the idea of uh, having the possibility to test Dirac and to use it is something we provide to our French users through our national VO, which is multidisciplinary VO. But uh, I think it doesn't really apply to um, existing community that just want to come and try uh, as a scenario that, that, that you explained. And um, yeah. the second question I have for Andre is that on slide 16, you presented the ongoing work about integrating Dirac with, with cloud services. And the question is, how do you manage the virtual machine images in that scenario? Is it that Dirac just submits a virtual machine image, which then does the processing of a certain algorithm, and then the virtual image is destroyed? Or is it that Dirac operates services from virtual machine, machine images in the long term in the cloud? and then it just pushes jobs into the virtual machine image. So uh, this is really a very hot question uh, now in the development. So uh, you are, uh, the question is about uh, what is uh, the infrastructure to provision uh, the images. Is it correct? So if, if I'm an end user sitting on the top of the slide, uh, on slide 16, then do I need to have a virtual machine image or I just define jobs and the jobs are pushed yeah. into images that you create. And the idea is that uh, you as a user who is preparing the job, you should not really care about uh, uh, the prepara uh, preparation of the image which is suitable for your job. So uh, the idea is that uh, the jobs are providing requirements, including the platform on which uh, the job will be running, and then the system will choose uh, the appropriate image uh, for uh, this particular job uh, requirements. And uh, the image itself, uh, the management of the images itself uh, is uh, now, I think, the work in progress uh, both uh, in Dirac, in Agile uh, Cloud Task Force, uh, and for example, uh, the uh, marketplace uh, service of the Stratus Lab project, uh, now it's a good candidate uh, to manage uh, uh, the images uh, that are available uh, for, for this infrastructure. And uh, I don't think that uh, we have tried this out yet, uh, but the idea that eventually there will be a, a generalized service on the level of, uh, uh, let's say, federate, federations of the clouds that will uh, provide um, at least uh, a catalog of available images and uh, points where these images can be uh, retrieved, and uh, or yeah, and then uh, this service, uh, a generic service, uh, which uh, will be used by Dirac Web Cloud Management uh, Virtual Manager, uh, Virtual Machine Scheduler, it will be used uh, to get hold of those images. Uh, we are not planning, at least so far, uh, to um, make a sort of uh, repository of uh, uh, VM images. Uh, so we count uh, to use uh, third-party services uh, for that. Uh, so if it is answering your question. So I don't think that there is a definite answer now. This is the work in progress uh, in the various projects. So we are also participating to that. But there is no definite answer to that. OK, thank you very much. Is there any other question from anyone? OK. So my name is Takanuri Hala. I'm working for the Berkeley experiment in Japan with using Dirac. So I have one question about the, the Dirac file catalog in the page 23. So as you reported about the current value to experiment, so we are now using the Amgur as a metadata service. But uh, so we uh, performed the MCMAS production uh, the, these days. And 
to be honest, we face some the, the scalability problem of this the metadata service in Amiga. So I'd just like to know the Dirac, the, the file catalog service, so the scalability of the Dirac file catalog service. So I believe the LHCB has already used the uh, Dirac DSP. So I, I'd just like to confirm the, the scalability of this. Uh, first, uh, LHCB is not using Dirac file catalog. Uh, LHCB is using its own uh, um, custom uh, uh, bookkeeping database uh, for the data metadata. So uh, the Dirac file catalog uh, and metadata part of the catalog, uh, as I said, uh, uh, initially was developed for the ILC collaboration. And uh, now it is taken uh, on board also by BES uh, collaboration. Uh, and uh, so uh, in BES, uh, they have done uh, quite uh, an extensive uh, tests uh, of uh, uh, the performance of the catalog, including the metadata part. So uh, from this point of view, uh, I don't think we have uh, made a comparison of scalability of uh, AMCA and uh, Dirac file catalog. Uh, so in ILC, for example, they have about uh, 10 million entries uh, in the uh, file catalog uh, together with the user metadata associated with those entries. And uh, I uh, haven't uh, yet got any complaints about the scalability issues of that, okay? Uh, I don't think that we have uh, some other use uh, case uh, where uh, the higher level scalability was ne needed. So from this point of view, I would be uh, happy to see with you what are your actual requirements, I mean scalability-wise, because uh, we have to, uh, we can't, uh, 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 so there are certain measures in the file catalog uh, to increase the scalability, and uh, this is one of the focus uh, in the development of the file catalog. But uh, we have to uh, discuss that with the precise numbers. So what are, what would be the requirements in your case? I don't know exactly uh, the Bell uh, case uh, so 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 well uh, in order to comment about whether it will be scale more scalable uh, for uh, Bell than Anga. Okay, thank you. Your comment is very useful for us. So anyway, so according to you, the LHC people have already tested something. In the last CHEP uh, conference, uh, there was uh, an article uh, devoted to the file catalog. Uh, probably it would be nice if you have a look at that. There are some uh, measurements uh, of the performance as well, some numbers about that. Is there any more questions? Okay, if there isn't, then I would like to thank you for Andre for the, uh, for the presentation for all the participants for the attendance. So thank you all, bye.